I just read a tweet yesterday in which the woman was like, fuck Todd Phillips, fuck Jimmy Kimmel, and fuck Lawrence Scherf for disrespecting Joaquin Phoenix on that outtake. And I'm literally like, it's fake. Have you not read about it? It is fake. My mom thought it was real. She's very embarrassed for me. <laughs> Hi, I'm Larry Scher, and I'm a cinematographer. Today, I'll be talking about color in film and how cinematographers use color to help tell an effective story. For example, how do certain colors contrast on screen to create depth, separation, and mood? You probably noticed some changes just then, right? Well, let's take it back a second. So this flat, desaturated image is a result of us shooting on a digital camera in something called log. This camera shoots in S-Log3. You can basically think of it as a raw digital negative before the color grading has happened. Shooting in log lets us retain a wide range of colors recorded by the sensor, which an editor or colorist in post-production can grade any way they want. Much different, huh? We added blue variants, dimmed up the orange to complement the blues. I know it's all technical, trust me. You don't have to think of it as technical stuff. I was an economics major. I don't know any of this stuff. Color in film is comprised of three main elements. The color or hue itself, the saturation or intensity of that, and the brightness, sometimes referred to as value or tone. Saturation is probably the most subjective part of modern filmmaking. Values of color refer to shades or brightness levels. One way to create depth in an image is to use complementary colors or colors opposite each other on the color wheel. Blues go with oranges, reds with greens, yellows with purples, and so on. You can play around to create different color schemes. So, how does a cinematographer choose what colors to use in a movie? It's hard to talk about color in motion picture photography without thinking of the legendary cinematographer Vittorio Storaro. Seriously, after this is over, go watch The Conformist, Last Emperor, Apocalypse Now. He uses color as imaginatively as anybody in film history. He actually had a whole color theory and would assign colors to different moods in the movie, the emotions, the characters. We all have associations with color, memories, how we think about color. It's subjective. For example, green is a color in nature. It may evoke tension or envy or greed, or it may represent power of transition for a character. Whereas warm, yellows and oranges, may evoke emotion like comfort and home, love, tranquility. Or not, I don't know. It may make you wanna to go to the bathroom. Yeah, sorry. So, color has meaning in film, but it's an aesthetic choice. And some masterful filmmakers choose not to use color in the same way as perhaps Dororo or even myself and they use a limited color palette or desaturation to tell their stories. I've always appreciated how colors contrast within the same image and how they can be used in movies to help evoke certain emotions and tell the story. Let's look at some examples. Andrew, this is your father. Hello. In Garden State, the movie opens with him literally in a colorless world. He lives in a tiny apartment with all white walls and white furniture. We're trying to limit the color space because his life is a bit colorless at this stage in the movie. He opens up his mirror, very little color, only the pills are the only color that breaks up the scene. He drives to work in a fairly desaturated, busy highway. So then the next contrasting color, when he goes here, is, is an example of contrasting colors against themselves in scene to scene, not just within a scene. If you are willing to embrace color as a director, like Zach is, you're gonna look for opportunities to show color from scene to scene or certainly within the scenes. Fun fact, when we shot this, I said, has anyone actually done this? This is so unrealistic. Like driven away with the hose still in the car? Three weeks later, I did it. I'm just saying, it's clearly marked. Okay, we are definitely not supposed to be up oh, here. Come on. So this is a scene from The Hangover, which was the first film I did with Todd Phillips, who directed Joker. And here we are shooting on a practical rooftop in Vegas. And in terms of the lighting in here and the contrasting color of light, some of it is not necessarily motivated by emotion, but it's motivated by the desire to one, be authentic to the environment, but also to help separate the world via contrasting colors. 
We had a practical concern, which is we were shooting up there for real. So this is an example of how production design and cinematography are like entwined as closely as they can be because here as a cinematographer, I was basically helping to design the set by having us put in those fluorescents because we needed to light them in an environment in which we could shoot them from far away, you know, surround them so they have this cyan light. Well, on the rooftops, that red light is there as a way for airplanes and other things to see the rooftops and to see the, the boundaries. So those two contrasting colors of cyan and red made for just a really wonderful way to separate out the actors from their environment. Cheers. Cheers. Short mm -hmm. and sweet. What now? We wait. This is a movie I shot called Paul. They arrive on the top of a mountain to basically meet the spaceship that's gonna take Paul home. So the moonlight is the dominant source of light here, which is blue with a little bit of cyan, just personal preference as to where I like moonlight to be. They're supposed to see a spaceship coming, and in fact, it's a misdirect because it turns to be the baddie flying in a helicopter to come take Paul away. But I've always been really happy with the way this turned out, in part because we decided to put these moving lights on the end of a helicopter. And when we talk about color, and if we're talking about here, the color contrast, I love the way that yellow, and that yellow is not a yellow you see really naturally, mixes with the moonlight in this scene. That, that light that came through the trees could have been anything. If we had kept it blue or white light, I just think it doesn't have the same power and the same striking imagery that I was looking for. Another aspect of color in film is color temperature. It has to do with how the color white light looks like on camera in a given temperature. They're measured in Kelvin. And you often hear about indoor temperatures, like 3200 Kelvin, and outdoor temperatures, like sunlight, 5500 Kelvin. Lower temperatures are considered warmer and can give an orangish tint to a white object on camera. Higher temperatures are considered cooler and provide a bluish look. So for example, at 3200 Kelvin, if you introduce something at 2000 degrees Kelvin, it would be very warm and orange, like firelight. And at 5500 Kelvin, if you introduce something at 10,000 degrees, it would be really blue. You know, I gotta hand it to you, Stu. This place is paradise. So this is from Hangover Part Two. Here's a firelit scene, right? So it's warm, inviting. It's the calm before the storm. So the first image as they wake up is gonna be them waking up in a grimy room in the middle of Bangkok. It's daylight, but the lights are all on. There's a tungsten bulb in there to show contrast. There's uncorrected cyan fluorescence. The warm light that's coming in there now is representing heat, right? Because they're sweaty and hot. One of the things that we talked about when we talked about color temperature is the way it shows up in the form of like cool white or warm white. But the other thing that really plays into lighting that we see in our natural world is the green spike, or some lights may be very magenta, but often with fluorescence, they have a very high green spike. So it means in relation to the 3200 film stock, when it shoots an uncorrected fluorescent, as I say, it's also showing up with all that green spike in the form of green. So you mix that cool color temperature with the green and you get cyan. And that's that cyan that we saw in the room when they first woke up. In black and white, you can really see how depth is created with shadows and contrast and tone. The ultimate contrast being the silhouette. Whoa. Good job, guys. Obviously, that's one extreme, but there are different values of exposure we can use to varying effects. Famous still photographer Ansel Adams made famous the zone system, which was a way to think about exposure and tonality in a film image. The lowest value, zero, being toe black, and the highest value, 10, being white, with very little information at all. So you can think about an image and think of all the tonalities between there in 10 steps of exposure. That's a good way to think about the depth you can create through shadow, light, darkness. But another way to create that depth, in a way I really appreciate, is through color. Two things can be the exact same tonal range, but if they're different colors, they create depth within the same frame. <laughs> all right, here's a clip from Joker. He's suffering from severe insomnia at this point in the movie. He's going through this real crisis. You know, because Joker, in large part, is a movie about opposite ends of the spectrum, two sides of yourself, the shadow and the light. And so 
those contrasting colors is a lot like what's going on internally with Arthur. And that color difference makes a huge impact on the scene. If we drain the color out of this, you can really see what we're talking about when we're saying values and tonality of light. But suddenly, if we bring all the color back in, we're now creating separation with the color. The dramatic difference between the sodium vapor in the background and the uncorrected fluorescent cyan blue. One way to achieve natural color contrast in a movie is to exploit that 15 to 20 minute window each day known as magic hour. When the world is bathed in blue light and the balance of it mixes with all the natural light of the world, street lights, storefronts, fluorescence, anything that's in there is contrasting with that beautiful ambient blue light. This scene from Joker is a perfect example of Todd and I shooting at dusk. We contrasted the build of the storefront that Mark Friedberg, the production designer, did and added a bunch of color contrast in there, different colors to, to play off of the blues. You can get some real beautiful stuff. If you're willing to shoot in this tiny window and if everyone is hyper-focused, Funny thing happened though in Joker. On another shoot at dusk, for some reason, right as we began to shoot, right after the second take, they just started handing out tacos to the crew. <laughs> uh, I went a little crazy, because I went, wait a second, we have 20 minutes to shoot this scene. Can we just fucking wait on the tacos? <laughs> One of the fun things about Joker was creating Gotham in the 70s and early 80s. And for me, a large part of that was representing what the cities looked like back then. Well, a big part of the cities back then were the streetlights, and the streetlights were sodium vapor. You don't see sodium vapor as much anymore, and they're really going away. That green, orange, gross light. That's what we saw back then. That's how the city represented itself on film, but also in our memories. A little bit gross, but for me, quite beautiful. It's an example of the blue light that bathes the city at this time of day, and then us adding these warmer sodium vapor lights in those positions on the building. We turn some lights on inside the building. In the interest of the reality of the space and the world in which we live, we're now adding another color, this sort of warm, white, uncorrected fluorescent, the yellow warm, to his lobby. And then when he gets into his home, that's the first time we're introduced to some warm, comforting tungsten light. It's lamps, it's warm, it's inviting, um, and it's probably the warmest, most gentle uh, light that's in the whole movie. Could it kill me? <laughs> Those guys who look at sex like parking a car were like, there's a spot. <laughs> The fluorescents that existed back then, they were just gross and ugly and they had a green spike. And so in the interest of being authentic to the time, but also loving the contrast of that cyan to the yellow downstairs and then to the red here, this environment, because we're backstage, was a real opportunity to mix a lot of color. But he's going to go into an environment in which now he has to perform with all these red lights that have shades over them. And you can barely see the people. The idea is focusing on Arthur's struggle. So in terms of lighting and the tonality of the scene, the people were meant to be a bit invisible. This is really Arthur's moment almost for himself. But this slightly dirty, but a little bit cooler spotlight was in the interest of putting him in a very harsh, almost an interrogation light, overexposed, certainly not something that you can hide from. And here he was exposing himself in a really human way. Let me make a preface that I think is important. Everything I talk about is somewhat emotional and intuitive to me. So I often talk about contrasting colors like yellow and blue, because they're on opposite ends of the spectrum. So all you people that know about color theory, yeah, it's complimentary. I always say contrasting, forgive me. I don't know much. I'm just a simple guy trying to make a movie. Thank you so much for watching this. If there's two things you take away, one, all of this technical stuff, don't worry about it. Just feel the scene, feel the emotion of the lighting and try to express that as best you can in whatever you're doing. And second, 
I'm behind camera for a reason, so I apologize for all the stumbling around this thing. Use this in whatever way you can and go make something cool. Take risks and remember, no tacos at dusk. Come on, people. Shoot, small window of opportunity here. All right, thank you.